Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. But what does it mean for the language to be pure? Or when people say they want English to be pure, what are they talking about? Is Shakespeare pure? I mean, uh, in fact, uh, every stage of history, language, there is there is there's no such thing as a language. There are lots of things that are speaking that different people have. They will still say, this is the language of the Lord. All right, welcome to episode five of the Everything Keys. I am basically your host, John, and I'm joined again today by Nathan. What's up, Nathan? Hello. Hey. Uh, so last time, and th- this time we're, we're going to get to the, the last part, the last little section of the chapter we were on last time, and uh, the meat, we're... Where the rubber meets the road, we're going to start actually going over the signs or glyphs, as I call them, characters. And once he starts in on this, he's got a lot of things that he has to prove. From this point on, it's going to sort of snowball because he's going to have to try to prove a lot about the noun. And a lot of that's going to go into the text. And he's already made a number of statements about the noun. He's made a few about attribute and how that has to do with the noun. And I've made a lot more about attribute and how that has to do with a noun and a verb and and how they're all kind of interrelated. And in these really small sections, he's going to get started with, uh, I think, some statements that you just can't top They're so insightful from himself and from others. And he's he's going to give us a list of this idea, these ideas about these uh, glyphs or signs. And that's mostly what the material is going to focus on besides the Samaritan Pentateuch. And I do want to take a little time to straighten out his, uh, he seems to have a, um, like a split personality uh, concerning some of the the things that he asserts that he believes, and then he'll kind of revert to uh, to things that don't really m- make sense. And really, a lot of what he has to say about the Samaritan Pentateuch is is more based on tradition too, that nobody can prove, least of all him. Before we start that, though. Um, there was some question about, uh, what Nathan had asked me about Laban the last time we were recording. And I had forgotten some of what I had told him because at the time I was uh, in the midst of a word study and it bugged me that, that I had forgotten some, some key points to that. And it made me go back and take a look at it again. What I was telling him before he had asked me about it uh, in that episode, was that I thought that there was a connection between um, Laban, which in a few of its entries, let's just say in Strong's, it's referred to as white or things that were white, but I had maybe a concern that it might have more to do with red and I knew it probably had a good amount to do with wood because, for instance, H 3839, it, it is specifically referring to a wood. And that would be hard to dispute because it's literally something that Jacob takes 
and strips. He barks and literally makes what is inside um, the the sap, the pitch, whatever's in it uh, begins to seep out. And he's using this as some sort of an an animal. And we don't know exactly the animal because somebody has to do some serious studies on flora and fauna in the Bible. But it, it acts in a, as an aphrodisiac. Well, there was a number of reasons to this because I, I was at the time, I was very apt to thinking that the uh, the entries of Leban or Lebanese that that had to do with brick or tile were accurate. And it, it made me... Uh, start to believe that there had maybe more to do with Laban and red than white. However, after that, I did a, a word study all over again on Laban and a few words that I was finding around it. And I don't anymore think that it has to do so much with red, but I do have similar conclusions that I had uh, the first time. And here's what it comes down to. So, I can tell you for sure that in certain entries of, of Laban, as in Lebané, it definitely is talking about wood. Um, and then, of course, you have the entries of Lebané that are referring to the moon and its, its whiteness. You have it as a root to certain compounds or substances that clearly seem to be uh, a gum, something that is used possibly for incense, but definitely a, a, a gum of some sort. Um, and you have just kind of this idea of common sense when applied to some of these texts um, and the roots. The, the thing is about the roots, so it's just made up of your basic three glyphs. You have L, B, N, Laban. If it was, uh, if we were accenting the first biglyph root, Leb, it most often is translated as, and I think pretty correctly, either heart or inner self, Leb. Now, it, if... The accent was on the latter biglyph, Ben. Even though Ben is probably most often appearing as and translated as son, which usually has to be Beni, son of, Ben is more commonly used in things having to do with building. Building more than anything else. Now, I think the reason for that has a lot more to do with kind of, I hate how limited English is, but creations of a person and thus a son or a child in the case of like Banut or daughter. I know daughters oftentimes called Bet, um, but children Banut. You'll also see it in buildings or structures, banut and benit, and many words with that ben in it. So when you see things like there's all those passages where, where Laban and Laban roots are in Leviticus, where the, uh, the Lewim or Levites are being told how to spot a skin problem and how to know whether the person, the individual, should be kept uh, apart from other people for a certain amount of time to see how it develops. Now, usually in the text, they would always say, uh, if, if you saw Laban, they would always translate it as, if it's white. Um, however, Laban sometimes is used in those passages in a, a bit of an odd way, to where one could literally see it as weeping uh, or oozing. If you look at Laban with the accent on the first biglyph root, Leb, and you understand that an N at the end 
has it carries with it a meaning of proceeding. Could be something oozing from it. Which brings me to the fact that if there was a tree that was called the Lebanese and it had the same qualities, it could be because it was a sappy tree. We also know that Laban does have a lot to do with the color white because of other things it's associated with, and it does appear in passages where it is contrast it's compared to things that are white specifically like snow now that's a dead giveaway so it is highly likely a white wood and an oozing or sappy wood and it would probably be a common wood now i went to some um apothecaries who were that I don't want to use a word like out there, but they (laughs) certainly covered a lot more ground than most. And there were some of them that did believe that uh, conifers would act as an aphrodisiac, if not with people, possibly with animals. So there's that on top of that. Now, keeping those things in mind. The first time we see Laban is in Genesis chapter 11. It's the Tower of Babel story. And I'll just read in English, in the World English Bible, in, uh, in verse 4, or ver- verse 3, sorry. See, they had found a, a plain. They had found a nice broad area, which would be a pretty good area to, to build. Um, areas that are too craggy and uneven, they're not really great areas to build. So in English, they, they it says, they said one to another, come, let us make, and here's where it, they said bricks. Now, that's the Laban, and burn them thoroughly. So you have this idea that they're making bricks from the burning, okay? And then it says, and they had brick for stone, uh, and they use tar for mortar. But if you look at it in Obri, uh, in, in cha- uh, verse 3, and Ui uh, Amaru Aish al Roeu, so they, they said one to another, their associates, Ebe. Ebe is it kind of similar to, to them encouraging them, you know, uh, let's do this. It's, it's, it's almost more of a, a, an action word than. I don't know if there's an English description to it, but they do say na lebene. Now, the thing is that N at the front is an action tense. Anytime you see that at the front uh, of just about any word that could be taken as either a thing or an action, you need to see it as an action. Na lebene, lebenim. Okay, now you have something that could either be um, uh, an attribute in ongoing state or a thing in plural. Uh, and then here we got to the u na la sharape. And that's why they say, let's burn it thoroughly, because sharap is most commonly translated as burn. <clears throat> now, it doesn't have to mean excuse me, directly burn. We're just talking about something um, that could be well heated. Uh, Yeah, that's, um, you treat wood with fire. You do. And and I was going to come to that, actually. Yes, being a carpenter, one thing that you'll get familiar with if you do enough decks is there is a kiln-dried pressure treated wood because green or pressure treated womanized wood if you get it fresh it's so big uh, that literally the nominal dimensions of the wood are different than they're going to be once it dries and so when you put together let's say a deck or anything outside made of of green treated wood you have to come back later once it's all dried out for one thing to finish it and for another thing 
to adjust it, and it's going to adjust as it shrinks. That's one of the worst things about wet wood. And what people might not realize is how often wood is treated with heat. Because it's, it's either do that or let it season for however long it takes for it to thoroughly season. So, the idea of, a lot of people have made this idea out. They've said, well, here's the deal. So, this is, this is the, the infamous Tower of Babel story, okay? But I want everybody to realize a couple of things about this, and this is super, super important, There's nothing in the text that would make anyone think at a plain reading of the Obri without the extras, the baggage that has been put on it. There's nothing about it that would make you think that it was a structure, per se, that they were building that got Yahweh's attention, that angered him at all. They they literally say, they, they say, let's make a city, an oyer, and, and they say, and with a magdal. Now, a, a magdal, it's a, not quite a compound word. It's gadal, which is actually used for great. You have like the great sea. It is uh, a yam, a gadal. You just put an M on the front. It makes it basically into a thing, megadal. It's a tower. It could be an organic thing or an inorganic thing. Vineyards are described with towers, Cities are described with towers. Fortresses are described with towers. And they're all Megdal. That's all they said. They said, let's make a city with with a tower. They don't say the usage of that tower. And they certainly don't describe it in the way that, let's say, everybody wants it to be a ziggurat or something like that. They don't describe it like that whatsoever. Something like that, that would be a tower for, let's say, pagan worship or something, that would be a bemeh or Bemut, not a Migdal. Migdal was a common usage tower. If man built a tower, it would be a Migdal, common usage. So there's nothing uncommon about what they're doing. The thing is, they all got together, and they're <clears throat> they're conspiring for enterprise here. They're essentially going the way of Cain. They want to make a city with their tower, and they want to make a name for themselves. That's That really sh- is what people should take away from the story more than these fanciful ideas of this great tower. And I'm going to back that up with the common sense part, which Nathan just started in on. So there's a couple of things you can burn, right? As far as cooking, heating, in a kiln. You can do bricks. You could do steel because steel has to be heated too. I doubt they were working with steel at this point. And there's nothing about Leban or, or Lebanese that would make me think of steel or or, or any metal. Clay. Uh, what's that? Clay is a big one because uh, the cedars, especially Lebanese cedars, uh, grow in a specific type of clay that, uh, that yields itself readily to pottery and ceramics. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that I, was it. That was all I had. You can. I went blank. No, no, oh, no. It's you, okay. Things I'm, you can burn. I, oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Um. So what was I? Oh, yeah. The things that you could write. Things you can burn. Exactly. Um. So it's mostly it's, it's steel, clay, or. And I guess the, the emphasis here is that very few people would think, when they think of this, first off, know that shirap doesn't have to be directly burned. In fact, what you should look for when you see the word shirap, you should look for ash, because ash is the common word for fire. If you don't see like shirap with ash, it's not necessarily a direct to the flame thing. And you should usually suspect that it could be cooking to some degree or another. Um, essentially, what they're saying is they're using a verb, the uh, the the nusherepe, to sherepe, 
Um, let's cook it so that it's cooked. <laughs> um, which is not yeah. all that weird <laughs> because we're talking about a little bit different language. We're talking about one that uh, that is very descriptive, even in, in its actions. So, yeah, they could be saying, literally, let's take something that is either raw or, let's say, wet and cook it until it's cooked, until it's done, even. So, that could be brick, because with brick, you take clay, you grind clay, you add it with water, and maybe uh, certain stabilizers, depending. Or, again, it could be wood. Now, here's the thing. Okay, so some people out there have actually made little videos and documentaries about structural brick and how if you were to, let's say the people at the Tower of Babel, because there's always an emphasis on the tower, which in the text there's not, how they could make these structural bricks by using certain materials, let's say kaolinites, and, and cooking them a lot, and they would make them very strong. And then there's people who have done these experiments and put them under pressure and showed how strong they are. Well, what they don't do is they don't talk to you about their tensile strength, because I don't care how strong structural brick is. A wall that is made from structural brick has the worst sort of tensile strength, because what's going to happen is if there's an earthquake or if... Uh, there's settling and there often is settling, especially if you're going to make something uh, that's walls are composed of structural brick. It's going to be so massively heavy at the footers um, that you better expect some settling to, to one degree or another. And when that happens, that brick that was once you thought was so very strong is going to become so very weak because it doesn't have the tensile strength that, for instance, materials like steel or wood have. The other thing is you're very limited with what you can build with brick as far as a frame or skeleton And that's really important. When you think of when you think of any structure that we know of, there's not too many of them that can be made to any degree of height or um, think of a tower. One thing they're making is a tower. Even with something like block, let's say like mason block, good good mason block they're usually only typically rated a few stories high. And then you, once you get that high with the walls, you still would like, if you're going to be comfortable, <clears throat> a roof. And this is where long structural members with high tensile strength comes in. Being things like steel girders or wood. Now, if we want to think of what's readily on hand, you know, with steel, you, you have to, you got to find the ore, you have to extract the ore, you, you have to then melt these things down, you have to pour them into a mold, and then you have your various pieces of, of steel. Whereas with wood, if you want a, a very large, let's say very long structural member, you would want certain kinds of wood. And that's why uh, most builders, for as long as, as we even know of, have chosen conifers. Big, long, straight, evergreen trees. Now, the thing about them is that if they're well tended to, and if we're using them in a post and beam construction manner. They're extraordinarily strong. You don't need huge amounts of them. And what you can do is you can rough mill them. And if you build 
a pretty decent chamber in which to kiln these, to kiln dry them. You can dry them in a relatively short amount of time and build with them and have a very stable, very strong structural member for construction. So with all of the, the signs of Laban and Lebanese, the, the idea of, of seeping um, in all of those passages in Leviticus, um, the idea of it being white, the idea of this wood lebane that they off they'll they'll tell you they think it's poplar. That in a few in one passage in particular, Jacob strips this thing because he's wanting it to to ooze. He's looking for uh, whatever it is that's inside of it. He's using it as some sort of aphrodisiac, and it is certainly a type of wood. Um, when you put all of those clues together. And then you realize this, because the first thing that a lot of people who are relatively sharp and do some word studies will tell you is, no, wait a minute. I see, I see Laban in all of those passages where Israel is in Egypt and they're having to make bricks. And we know they're having to make bricks because they're having to gather straw. Well, here's the funny thing about that. I did a bit of a word study on that too. And in Exodus, let's just go to Exodus 2, and I'll give you this one, and, and I can wrap it within just a few minutes. As soon as I find um, the word for straw here real quick, then I can give you, actually, it's in, I think it's Exodus 1. Um, yeah. And... I'm in the right, I'm in the right area. Okay. Boy, I knew this was going to happen. Made the lives bitter in mortar and brick, all kinds of service. And, and they're just saying hammer and, and lebane. And, and that whole hammer thing. The, the funny thing about hammer is it, interesting in, uh, in Genesis 11 they say, and, and let us use hammer to hammer. And I've got a real funny feeling right now about hammer too, um, whether it is mortar, whether it is pitch. Uh, and I haven't had time to do a serious word study on that either. Okay, if it's keep... pitch, um, that is the ultimate support. While you hunt for that. Well, actually, just... here's what's funny. Here's what's funny. Uh, hammer? <laughs> It is translated in certain passages as pitch or tar. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, the idea that yeah. we think that there are poor sheep herding desert people that built brick out of the dirt that they stood on and mm. set it on fire and roamed around the desert. Well, and you know what's it? And no, there there were yeah. forests. And yes. they built most of their structures out of wood, there were massive of trees, so giant that we don't know they're like today, except no. in one place on the earth where there is something called the Pinus Lambertiana, and that is the giant sugar pine in California, in mm -hmm. Yosemite National Park. Yosem Wait a minute. Yosemite? Yosemite. That sounds like Yosemite. That's weird. Yeah. And do you know what it's called? <clears throat> What's that? The cedars. Cedars are a redwood, no matter what you do to them. However, when we talk about Laban, the giant sugar pine is a member of the white pine group. These, this wood turns white when it is treated, when it's dried. Mm -hmm. And it's a giant tree capable of building any structure. And... California is one of nine small groves in the world that still has them. Are you are you yeah. aware of of how well conifers, cedar, redwood, and the various pines work with stone and brick and concretious materials? Oh yeah, they're, that's why they're so preferred to use. Let's say you were building a, a, a really huge structure and you needed 
framing members that were going to last next to stone and, and brick. I don't know how often they used concrete at this time or in this culture. I really don't. I've never gotten that far. I, I have no idea. But let's just say stone and brick and all that. It's, it's far the, the most preferred wood is a conifer. Absolutely. Go ahead and keep talking. I'm still looking for it. I, I'm, I'm probably looking right at it. I've just got to <laughs> whittle it down. I just got to find straw real quick. So, so there's, there's a few different ways that you can ensure that something lives on after you kill it. And that's a funny way to open this statement. But if you were to fell a grove of sugar pines, the only thing you need to do to ensure that they survive is you haul the lumber away and you burn the land. This will actually open the cones and you mm -hmm. leave it alone. And in a decade, you will have new sugar pines with no work, no gotcha. cultivation. And so when, when you said, you know, cook them so they'll be cooked, mm -hmm. you can actually just burn the land around these timbers on site. Is that right? Yep. You can treat the whole thing on site. And it's, it's not a way we do it today, but it's a feasible method because um, the fire will burn itself out and the trees, and they're large. They won't be that affected. And we're talking like, um, mm. remember Mark Wahlberg in Planet of the Apes? You know, literally. Trees yeah, go, that big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I haven't seen it in a long time, but yeah. Paul Giamatti is an orangutan. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, they were that large. And so as far as using wood, there are plenty of old buildings and we have, we have a lot of urban explorers that listen in, um, <clears throat> go into any building built at the turn of the century. We're mm -hmm. talking 1880s to 1910s. Um, there's a few in the city that I live next to. And I was in an old furniture shop that had been repurposed three or four times, but it's factory size. We went into the downstairs. It's all porn cement, but these bricks are from the 1880s and the original timbers are still used. And we're talking timbers, maybe a tenth of a city block long four people wide mm -hmm. they are massive and they are untouched and they're supporting a four-story brick building mm -hmm. and this building i mean you can't burn this building down it would have to be demolished it'll stand for another 200 years believe it yeah now what's interesting is in uh, in genesis 11 3 they do say after they they make that statement about the Lebanese and the uh, Sharape, they actually say um, they use a term that oftentimes they try to say is is a prefix and a suffix put together, which is la m, um, and I'm not positive that that that's what it actually means. It it might have something more to do with in in course of, and then they say uh, the Lebanese. La Aben to Aben. Now, Aben's oftentimes just translated as as stone. Um, but what they could be saying here, because nobody can actually prove it, this is very speculative, especially when the rules are all Masoretic, and and they know it. They know it. They don't teach it this way, but they know it. They know how subjective all of this is. Now, what they could be saying is that the the Lebanese, they could be making as hard as stone, and they would actually be using it like stone. And then that's when they say, uh, ooh, eh, hamar, eh, yeah, la, em, la, hamar, to hamar. This is one of those words, again, they're, they're displaying the, three different words here that actually have a noun form and a verb or attribute form in, in this verse. It's a pretty amazing verse for that. 
Now, just because they're they're saying that they're going to use this this Lebanese in lieu of stone, that does not make it brick. First off, because there's plenty of things you can use in lieu of stone, and for any reason, because you can use wood for framing members and walls instead of stone. And the other thing is, I want people to consider something else. A lot of people sometimes, because this is in the text right after the flood of Noah, might think that maybe there wasn't enough time for some great trees to be growing, or a lot of them. Not so. Not so. Um, There's actually a channel, I think the channel's called Nathan83, where he did a a really good um, uh, proof of why you should trust the Septuagint's timeline concerning the uh, the children or the, the descendants from Noah on down to it would have been the time of Ober, which is where we get the the language name from, and his sons, um, which would be uh, Peleg and Yuktan. That would have been right around the time this happened. And if you go with the Septuagint's timeline, it gives you just about eight hundred to a thousand years <clears throat> from the time that the ark would have landed. Until this time, that is plenty of time to grow a heck of a lot of big, strong, beautiful trees. For one oh, thing. Yes, indeed. You would need, honestly, 300, 400 years uninterrupted to have enough lumber to feed the world for a decade. Mm-hmm. Now, that's the short time. If, if you went with the Masoretic text, you still have at least a couple few centuries, at least still then, yeah. before we get to this point in time. I did find the uh, I did find the reference um, in Exodus. It was actually five seven. So I'm okay, glad I good. typed that in. <laughs> I can put my mic on mute. I didn't realize I was eating breakfast for the world to hear. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's the funny thing, and I can't go into the whole word study because I did not write down all the details, but. This is where it is straw, because a lot of people, like I said, they think uh, they think of Egypt wrongly, and they think of Lebanon in passages like Exodus 5-7, because in, for instance, the King James, it, it says, like, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick, as heretofore let them go and gather straw for themselves, and it's H-84-0. One interesting right off the bat, the word here, if you'll remember what I'm saying about Ben and basically a lot of building materials, natural building materials, um, or just things that are built have the root Ben in them. This word is Teben. So it starts with the ta and ends with ben. And it actually only appears about 17 times total. Um, real quick, I'm checking before and after. Uh, in 8402, you have Tabani, and then in 8403, which is actually used as a, a proper name, and then 8403, you have Tabanit, um, which is used. Now, this is interesting. It's used, translated as pattern, likeness, form, similitude. Tabanit with that uh, eat at the end, it's oftentimes a sort of feminine derivative. Um, if you were saying a woman that was of the tribe of Yuda, you might call her a, a Yuda eat, eat or tea. Um, there's a little bit of, if you ask the Masoretes, they would say um, that eat is similar to un in that it is um, diminutive. I don't know if that's true in the same way, but it does seem to be, in a sense, effeminate. And it's pretty successfully translated as things like pattern, likeness, form, similitude. So let's go back to 8401. This is the tabin that's used for the straw in the brick and so on and so forth. Um, for instance, 
in Genesis 24, 25, this is where um, I believe Abram's servant d- travels to find a wife for Isaac. And he meets uh, Rebecca, <clears throat> and it says that she says, uh, we have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. But again, what she could be saying, literally, is simply supplies. That they yeah, have supplies material. or materials. Basically it. It's again, it's not specific. This is a general word. Um, in Genesis 24, 32, um, let's see. Again, the same thing when it says that he uh, he unburdened the gimel. And I'm going to see, I'm going to switch this real quick and look at it in Obri. Uh, let's see. Uiba, the uh, Aish. All right. Abite and... Yepata, Egemalim, Yeten, Teben. Okay, he just gave Teben. Uh, and this is the, the word they're using for prov- provender. Uma sep- uh, masepwa. You know, from the, the form of that word, Masepwa, again, it just seems like something that is generic. Because I, I might have mentioned, well, I did in my last Bible in Obri about a lot of words with this root of sap having to do with basins or storage. In fact, sap is often used when it says that someone was gathered to their people. <laughs> because we in know place? that a lot of people were mummified and preserved. Sap just by itself has a lot to do with... Um, usually storage. So huh. to call something uh, masapua, I, I don't think it necessarily specifies a grain or a material in general. I think it's, again, one of those generic terms. Now, then you get into Exodus. And I'm going to switch back to English here real quick. Exodus 5, 7, I just read. Um, and then 5, 10 through 3, and it says the taskmasters of the people went out and their officers... Uh, they spake to the people saying, thus says, uh, pro, we will not give you. And here's that taben, which is translated straw. Um, you will get you taben where you can find it. Well, well, where you can find it. Okay. That's interesting. Yet not aught of your work shall be d- diminished. Um, so I don't know. I guess maybe... If we're going to believe that they're actually making mud bricks, which are sun-baked, usually with straw. And here's the thing. As far as the the straw of of a plant, that's typically the best for its fibrous quality. It's it's Mm -hmm. typically rice straw is what they'll often use in there. Now, I know these days, Egypt does grow a certain amount of rice. So they might have rice straw in there um but again i wouldn't know all of the conditions they would necessarily need to to be told to go and find your own rice straw it's it it, it's kind of a little weird to me and i haven't thought that one out completely doesn't have to be rice straw okay but i'm just saying if this is in egypt i know that they can grow that crop pretty decently there So I would have to assume if we're talking about straw that it would have to be rice straw. Now, I don't see rice mentioned once in the Bible. That's one thing. And I'm not saying that there's no rice in there, but I am saying I don't recall it being mentioned once. A lot of corn. Anyways, again, in the context where this is being used, you can't prove that it's straw. Okay? And I'm going to go fast forward a little bit here because in the whole context of Mitzram, it, it's basically a, exactly the same thing over and over. A, and again, in in Judges, it appears in 19, 18 and 19. And again, we have those two words that we had before because we're talking about, um, let's see, 
towards the side of Mount Aparum. From thence, I went to, uh, and I hate the way they transliterate names, so I'm not even going to try to pronounce their garbage. Uh, where is that at? It always toggles back and forth when I go from uh, the Obery to the English because they're, uh, here it is, it's in verse 19. So the same words, and Maspua, again, Maspua. And I did actually look into Isaiah eleven seven as well, because this is the one where a lot of people say, um, well, you know, what about the, the lion and it's um, eating straw? Um, well, I don't, you know, how many animals actually do eat straw? Animals eat grass to calm their stomach. You see mm. it everywhere. Chickens pet gravel. So, I mean, sure. The funny, now, sure. the funny thing about this is if this is, if this is anything to do with the making of anything, whether it be a brick whatever it is, um, we don't have any idea how they were using this material to make or produce or do whatever they were doing with that Lebanese. I That would have certainly made the long story short, but everybody knows that I'm really not into that. Um, I like <laughs> taking the hard way. Yes. So the whole point is, you're going to have a hard time proving that this word to Ben, that it specifically is first off straw. And if it were that they specifically needed this straw to insert into a mud brick to dry and build with. Now, again, remember they're building two store cities for Proa store cities we just went over this idea of structural brick. I've seen houses, by the way, uh, and various structures that have been made with mud brick, and they seem really nice. And, and by the way, and let's get to this too, because it sh really should go in here. Um, mud brick, as well as, as run-of-the-mill typical brick, and stone are all very fire retardant, by the way. Mud brick's really fire retardant. It's earth. When's the last time you've seen somebody burn dirt? Yeah, burn the dirt. You know, it's like the idea of piling tons of bodies into a great big pit and thinking you can burn them all. <laughs> so they they actually, they, <laughs> they, 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 they retard fire really well. And the problem is, anybody who wants to check will see that over and over and over again. When a city is sacked, they oftentimes burn it down. How do you burn down a city that's made of stone and brick? I don't care if it's made from clay brick or earthen brick. Once the combustible materials within the structures are consumed, you're going to be left with that shell of a city that has been mostly constructed of stone, block, brick, or earth brick. Why would they even think to burn down a city that was mostly constructed of those things? They would have to try to wreck the city. You know, that is the case with every single major American city that has ever been built. There is a massive fire that somehow demolishes a city made of bricks. How does that happen? It happens regularly, and then they rebuild it, um, not with bricks. It is very strange. How did a um, fire consume a brick city? Let's let's talk a bit about the stripping and using of a tree as an aphrodisiac. Yeah. Do you know Do you know what's in the heartwood of sugar pines, pines, cedars, all of this? I Giant don't. Sequoias? I don't, but it is pretty. Go ahead. Syrup. Yes, yeah, syrup. It's sugar. So for for a people that does not have, they don't have coffee, they don't have alcohol, 
Nobody has ecstasy. Nobody has fun drugs. Sugar is a drug, and we've always known this. What do you Sugar's give a girl a on Valentine's drug. Day? Chocolates. <laughs> I was going to say something else. Oh. All right, yeah, chocolates. <laughs> You're right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Man, we got to get on the same page. You're right. There's a oh. lot of sugar in there. All you April babies. <laughs> a lot of sugar in there. But yeah. that's just it. And And not only this, but depending on the type of tree and what you do to it to the the tar or syrup yeah from its heartwood you get different effects pine tar is still one of the the most widely used sealants and varnishes because yeah. it's impure turpentine mm -hmm. literally the secret to sealing these trees even from fire mm -hmm. is using their own blood Interesting. And so everything you need uh, when you Turpentine, take down these, right. yeah, everything yeah. you need with these large timbers is already in them. Yeah. You take the tree down, you, uh, you might even bleed it first. You put a steel in a tree um, or style, S-T-I-L-E, yeah. and you bleed it like maple syrup. Well, you can do that with any tree as long as you get to the heartwood, but you have to strip past the Cambrian layer first mm -hmm. or the Cambrian layer. Mm -hmm. And once uh, once it's been successfully sapped, then you take the tree down and now you actually have the varnish to treat it once you have tempered it with flame. I mean, everything you need is already there. Mm. That's all so interesting. Maybe some of the people who are listening can help fill in the blanks. Just just think a little bit about, you know, what, what would be some general things that, um, you could say that you would have to use for making all kinds of different things. You know, even if, even if Tibet was, was whatever, let's just say there's various ways to, to, you know, make these things or use them in, in, in making things. We don't have a description of um, this word, Tibet actually being inserted into a, a clay mold and sun-dried. If we did, then I think that would be more conclusive. But you see, everything that you just said there, along with everything I found, is leading me far more to the conclusion that when we see Lebanese, we're talking about wood we're talking about wood for every possible quality the the weeping of it and how you um do extract um its blood or whatever it it may be called um and of course this would have a lot to do with why there was um just an enormous place that I don't even know the size of it because one of the hardest things it's been for me writing a book on geography of the Bible is to gauge sizes. They're very difficult because in, in many instances you'll get these, um, these descriptions that something was a one day journey or 10 day journey, but we don't know exactly how they were journeying, what vehicles they might be using, if any, or what animals they may be riding, if any, what the terrain was like, and so on and so forth. But there is a gigantic yeah. area that seems to be to the north of the land that we're mostly focused on in the Bible, that the place is called El Lebanon, and we know that that un suffix is very much like our English O-U-S. So this place would be... <laughs> Rather than well, what's the typical, the mainstream story we get is that Lebanon, uh, the, the, the modern country on the Mediterranean coast called Lebanon, they would say that it got its name from this, this area, which is a huge area that actually covers far more ground than the modern day country of Lebanon would. Um, and they say that it got its name from the snow capped mountains. Well, 
you know, there are a few mountains around around Lebanon. Actually, the, the most impressive one is not even in Lebanon. It's in Syria, and that's Mount Hermon. It's a lot further off to the east. But, I mean, as far as snow-capped mountains go, and I'm not trying to put down Lebanon, it's nothing special. And the thing is, the whole white idea in Laban, and there is some, but that's not the predominant idea to that word. Um, the more predominant idea to that word is the description of something that is a little bit more, first off, building material. Secondly, something that is weepy or sappy. Those are the two strongest roots in this. So if if I were to pick one wood that I would have to describe as everything I see behind Laban, it would be something like a sugar pine, pine, fir, cypress, tall, conifers, redwoods, western red cedar, that kind of wood. And the, the thing is, I don't know if I can think of an area that's just gigantic, that is mainly typified by trees like that. Oh, wait, there is the Pacific Northwest. Yo, Semite. <laughs> and, and yo, Semite. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And snow-capped mountains. And this this leads to uh, a statement that actually, I mean, that could get you ovened in the right circles. But the statement that the Hebrews of this time were um, a lumber industry, that they were uh, woodsmen. Well, uh, certainly uh, a, a percentage of them were. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the thing is, and here's where the, the study of flora and fauna, which I'd, I'd love to write another book when I was done with the, the geography book that I'm working on concerning either the flora or fauna or both, which I think I'd have to divide it into two. There's so many descriptions of, of trees, different kinds of trees. Um, and look, I know I mean, Palestine has a, a, a good amount of trees just just in the northern part of Palestine, but nothing like you would call the the forests that are mentioned, described, or the kinds of trees that are described. I went over one word <clears throat> in, I think it was the last uh, Bible in Obri I did. I did a word study on all the other colors that were non-metallic that I found. And one of the words was Ronin. It was uh, air, O, N, N. And it was describing a tree in which the uh, the Israelites would use it, and I believe mostly in the springtime, because it would be fruitful and budding. But everything about its description would be of one with vast, strong branches, high off the ground, spreading out very far uh, to create something like a cloud cover for them to do whatever they were doing under the trees. Maybe it was Valentine's Day. I, I don't oh. know what rituals they were performing, but it would take trees like that That's, to do that. That is, that is a, a sugar pine. And I, I have to segue once again. Yeah. An uninterrupted forest has something that nothing else has. It has no branches below the top. They look like popsicles. Yeah. They look like how would I say they look like flowers and it's actually when uh, when they cluster up so high um, their timber grows straight uninterrupted and they actually don't grow low branches yeah. because the sun doesn't come low then come low and yeah. it's it's only when you top a tree that a tree is forced to grow its new lead or its new trunk out of whatever branches are left so yeah. when you see a gnarly forest like uh, right now the cedars of Lebanon, uh, cedars Lebani in in Lebanon is featuring all of these old growth trees that you can tell have been previously topped. An mm -hmm. uninterrupted forest would be a forest of pines with mm -hmm. enough cloud cover to provide shade for miles. 
anybody who's visited Northern California knows exactly what you're talking about with a kind of lumberjacking industry out there and the sort of evergreens that grow out there mm-hmm. and the way that they grow. And it does. That's what it looks like. I mean, you're not having problems walking through there because you're not going to encounter a branch. Not for some time. You'd have to climb up it because that's where mm-hmm. they're getting their sunlight from. And so most of them you're going to see trunks with essentially branches that that were growing at one time but had to just die off. They dropped off, fell off, were broken off. Um, and that's the way these forests grow. Yep, that's it. The Hebrews were lumberjacks. It all happened in California. A lot of the ones <laughs> at the uh, at the north certainly were. Certainly. Well, yeah. see, because there was a there a huge city, huge, huge trading city, and it also had a lot of land too. Tsur. And and Tsur is near another place with a, a heck of a lot of land, Tsidun. Now the people of Tsur is who Solomon writes to because they were the experts at actually felling trees. Now, look, if you're hmm. using run a mill trees. You don't need experts in felling them. You really don't. Because I've gone out when I was relatively young and and felled trees on my own. Decent sized trees. Now it can be dangerous if you're just stupid. But in general, most people can go out and fell a tree with an axe pretty good. He needed people that these people were experts in bringing these trees down. And transporting them. You don't need to be expert in that unless we're talking about serious trees. Really serious yeah. trees. The, the, the scope of know-how completely changes. When you reach a, a specific tree type, it's completely different. A locust or an oak tree, if you're used to falling evergreens, a locust oak tree will kill you. They're hard, brittle woods. Maple can be that way too. Um, Mm -hmm. Not in the Northwest, but elsewhere. And then you have a dangerous tree, the cottonwood. They'll grow as straight as all get up, but the wood actually twists and bursts if you fell it wrong. So you can, you can actually cause a tree to explode like a bomb. It'll fill you full of wood shrapnel. Just because there's so much torsion tension in this standing tree. Mm-hmm. So you, when you get to the larger trees, and we're talking about 100 feet and higher. Yeah. That's where, that's where it takes skill. You need a professional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the kind of trees we're talking about. And uh, don't anyone out there forget that um, Solomon sent these huge teams of people, by the way, uh, up to this area, this uh, El Lebanon. And they would be up there for rotations. Uh, they would be working with um, Hiram's people because these people of Tsur and Sidon, they, they had been there for m- many centuries before uh, the Israelites had moved in. Now, there was a suggestion by Joshua that the, 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 uh, the men of Aparum and Menashe actually go up there and create their own settlements too. Whether they did or not, I'm not 100% sure. But they were up there for rotations of time, long periods of time actually, to fell enough trees to make all of these structures in, are you seriously going to freaking believe Jerusalem over in Palestine? Are you seriously going to believe that? Anybody? Can I see a show of hands? Anyone? Anyone? Do you believe that? I don't believe that. But. That's a crazy idea, too, because if Solomon was where I think he was, then directly north of him would have been the forests we're talking about, which include the rivers that once flowed through the land but were diverted, i.e. the Columbia. Mm-hmm. It's, um, I mean, the, the, that's crazy. The geography still fits on the, Columbia the West was, Coast. Yeah, that was actually the river that, that I had pegged for the Parat, mm-hmm. what everybody calls the Euphrates. And everybody, like, 
you know the easiest way to get a to get a tree from one place to another. You put it in the water and you let the water take it. You bet. Done it for centuries. You bet. <clears throat> yeah, they, and they used to make. Um, they used to actually make artificial rivers to to float logs, you know, into larger rivers and various uh -huh. dams. I mean, that's 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 the way you do it. And the thing is, for in my paper, um, Euphrates, a problem with geography. That's precisely what I say. Is that based on all of the descriptive material in the Bible, the Parat, which is translated Euphrates, the Parat actually would have flowed through the area called Lebanon. It would have emptied <laughs> out in the sea somewhere around Tzur and Sidon. And that's why I think that Tzur was such a great city is because it was maybe not at the confluence. In the paper, I said near the confluence, but I rethought that. Um, based on what makes a city, city um, very defendable and what makes it most profitable if it's inland, uh, just a certain degree, to where large ships can sail to it, but it's, it's rather fortified, it's defended from the sea and from mm -hmm. invaders. Uh, a perfect location for, let's say, a, a very profitable city would be like Portland. that would be where you would have an extremely profitable city. In fact, a lot of times what they would do is, when they were coming to the new world, as it's called, is cities would oftentimes be based on as far up as the ocean-going ships could sail in the river. Mm -hmm. You need a port of entry, but yeah. your, uh, your domiciles and... And your people have to be far enough removed that no attack by sea can be a threat. Mm -hmm. This was until certain variables in that changed, but yeah. And that's likely where Tsur was. Or the, the one other possibility, it was either um, far enough in uh, to sail ships uh, on a rather large river, uh, it could be one, or secondly, it could be that it was in a large sound or harbor. That's the second possibility with Tsur. Um, now, a Tsur is actually, uh, a Tsur by itself is a cliff face of a rock. Um, so, if you find any good cities that would match that sort of uh, location and description, that have either cliff faces of rocks around them, you know, that would be great. I remember yeah, once thinking San, of San Francisco yeah. because of the rock in the harbor. Uh, Big Sur. What's that? <laughs> Big Sur. Big Sur. In California is, um, is a prominent land that is completely cliffs. It's like... It's California's all ver It's California's version of well, Ireland. Well, then why do you think it's, it's called gorgeous. Sur? Yeah. <laughs> big Sur. No, it's Big Sur. Cliffs. People don't realize that. That's that's exactly the thing that Moses was told to strike that water came out of. It was a Sur. It was a cliff, by the way. <laughs> it's crazy. We've, they didn't even bother changing the names of these things. A lot of them, no. Crazy. Isn't that funny? But, you know, you, you go to, a, I don't know, you go to anything that you have to get an, an etymology from and they're, they're going to lie to your face. Even the online etymology dictionary. That, yeah, they that's can't a possibly, run around. Yeah, it is. About the only thing you can do with that is find words. But I wouldn't take their, I wouldn't take what they say about them. You're actually going to have to find books with etymologies in them that are not written by untrustworthy people. They're not easy to find. But we've been we've been at this for over an hour and we haven't even gotten to it. But this has been fun. So no, that's just, fine. just a prime example of yeah. how much there was to dig into when I said, remember that time you told me about trees and yeah. all that it meant? That's um, that's what I meant last time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Uh, Wow, I, I really had hoped over the last year or two that more people would kind of grab onto 
a lot of what I was saying when when I would say the Bible's not a boring book. There's there's so much information there to tap into. You just have to put the time in to figure out where it's at. Um, and how much there is to, you know what? And we got to use our brains too. That's one of the biggest problems with religion is equating the Bible with religion. Everybody turns their brain off. They've been told this tower of Babel story. And I didn't even read it closely for the longest time and realize that the, uh, the main focus of attention there isn't even the tower. That's not, that's not the focus. So again, we have something that goes back to um, these occult archetypes, like with Egypt and with this Tower of Babel. It's an occult archetype, and it actually doesn't have um, it doesn't have a root uh, factual basis in the Bible. So, just another good illustration of that, I think. Okay, and so I think that leads to a pretty good segue in the text, this uh, section three of, I don't know, it was probably chapter two. Let me scroll back a little bit. It was chapter two, section three. This is pretty much just a blow by because it's just going over ground we already covered. He's, again, he's asserting that this whole, um, the whole text we're looking at, he, he's claiming, because <laughs> the, the next chapter, in my opinion, he's going to completely contradict himself. He's asserting that um, this, this Samaritan Pentateuch, um, invented by the, the Chaldeans, they're, they're, they're the Kashadim, Kashadim, not Chaldeans, Kashadim were these people. Um, to note the pronunciation of the words. Now, here's the thing. I don't know where he gets this from other than traditions um, brought to us by and handed down by the same people, definitely responsible for Masoretic Hebrew. <laughs> the idea that Ezra and the other Hebrews uh, uh, adopted this idea of vowel pointing because somehow they forgot is ridiculous. There's no proof of it. And uh, there's, there's some weird anomalies here too, by the way. If, if anybody wants to l look up the Samaritan Pentateuch, um, you can find it on a lot of websites. Um, the one I have is, um, well, geez, the address is too long and complicated to even say it, it's at the university of Cambridge digital library. They, they have it. Um, and what they say about it is it is the, uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, MS ADD 1846. Now the weird thing here is they say the Samaritan Pentateuch contains the text of the Torah. Okay, so the first five books um, of the Hebrew Bible is written in the consonantal Samaritan script. If you look at it and you compare it to uh, what they call Aramaic today, those those characters are very similar then to to this modern Aramaic. Now, what we read if basically any Bible version you have, when it gets into the books that are supposed to be written in Aramaic, you're going to see that they're they're just written in a a block calligraphic Hebrew character uh, with the same orientation, with the same vowel point system. The biggest difference is, and a lot of the words are actually the same, but certain words, they may substitute the, uh, and I'll, I'll just use Hebrew terms. They'll, they'll substitute maybe the shin for the tav. They may substitute a tav for a resh. 
Um, they might sometimes substitute a tsari for an ayin. But it has a very, very, very similar uh, look to it, pronunciation in many instances. In fact, there are um, there's such a small amount of variations within uh, the biblical text between portions that are called Hebrew and portions that are called Aramaic that there's absolutely no way that that is anything like the descriptions that we see in books like, for instance, Jeremiah, where it says there is a nation of people, and it's speaking of the Kashdim, that they call the Chaldeans, coming with a strange language that you don't understand. That is difficult to believe that what we're talking about is what they represent as Aramaic. So, at the University of Cambridge Library, it does say that it's a development, they claim, a development from Paleo-Hebrew script. I don't know how. I've looked at it. It bears few resemblances to even what they call Paleo-Hebrew. Uh, and Paleo-Hebrew, again, is, is pretty subjective because they claim a lot of things that there's so there there are so many uh, artifacts and papyri and scrolls that have so many sorts of variations of these characters that are so very similar. And then some they they would claim that it's Phoenician, and in others they would claim that it's uh, a certain period Hebrew or Paleo Hebrew would be just a period of Hebrew, some they would claim is Moabite, Canaanite, ad nauseum. This copy was what they claim it was an 1846 tribal or scribal transcription, uh, and it's to believe believed to be the earliest extant manuscript of the Samaritan Pentateuch. So, and they say it, it dates from the early 12th century common era. Huh. Um, that's pretty late. And so there's just, there's absolutely no proof. It, it, just like the idea that they claim that the New Testament has to have been written in Greek because they said, well, the earliest manuscripts we believe are Greek. And when we say early, besides for, for like majority text manuscripts, which are pretty late, and, and we know they're pretty late, they would claim that some of the minority texts like uh, Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, not Van, um, Sinaiticus would be like fourth century. They claim, again, no proof. It's one of those things with this. And a lot of what he's saying could be just based on tradition. Now, there's a couple of factors to keep in mind. One factor to keep in mind is that um, for instance, the Babylonian Talmud and all Kabbalistic works were up until the last couple of centuries written almost exclusively in Aramaic, what we would think of as uh, the, the Aramaic of the Bible with that block script and with those vowel points. Now, that's interesting because there is actually a history in the Bible of uh, something that occurred, which is actually the most likely origins that, that he doesn't even cover. And it's in 2 Kings chapter 17. And I'm going to go with the most readable, which is uh, World English Bible. But in uh, 2 Kings 17.24, it says the king of Asher brought men from Babel, Kute, Oe, Hamat, Separuim, and then they placed them in the cities of Shomron. Shomron was actually a city itself. It was a city that was so 
massive that it actually had a number of cities too. That's that's how people got the the title of Samaritan because they literally named a whole region because of this huge city that was the capital city of the Northern Empire before they were overtaken by Asher. So he placed them there instead of the children of Israel and they possessed Shomron and lived in its city. Uh, so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they didn't fear Yahweh. Now the word fear, it's Yira. Uh, it's actually derived from the same root as Ra. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 1 where it says that uh, Aliyim uh, Ra or Yira something like say the light and saw that it was good. It actually more likely means acknowledges. So they didn't acknowledge him. Uh, in any way, their behavior. Uh, therefore, he sent lions. Now, this is, uh, uh, the root is Auri. And who knows what kind of animal that could be. Among them, which killed some of them. Therefore, they spoke to the king of Asher, saying, the nations which you have carried away and placed in the cities of Shomron, they don't know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent a uh, Airy among them, and behold, they kill them because they don't know the law of the God of the land. The king of Asher, he commanded, saying, Carry there one of the ken, or priests, whom you brought from there. Let them go there, dwell there, and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Shomron came, and he lived in Betal. Now that's a city in Benjamin. Shomron was actually in Zebulun, and both of them were somewhat closely located with um, Aparam kind of in between. Aparam was, was sort of the mainstay tribe uh, with its lands uh, of the northern kingdom. Uh, so he came there, he lived in Betel, he taught them how to uh, fear Yahweh. Now here's the problem, was that they were bringing in one of these priests that they had carried away. If he was a, a Ken that was actually living in the Northern Kingdom, then he would have already been practicing these, these pagan practices that Jeroboam started during the split anyways. Now, it, it goes on in 1729, however, every nation made gods of their own, and they put them in the houses of the high places. There's the Bemeh, which uh, the Shomrini had made every nation in their cities which they had lived. Uh, the men of Babel made this. Now, now, these things, nobody seems to know exactly what these are, though some people I'm sure know. Uh, Sekut Benut, uh, the men of Kut made Nergal, the men of uh, Hamat made Ashima, and the uh, Oe, they made this Nibhaz and Tartak. Now, here's what's interesting. The, uh, the Seperuim burned their children in the fire of Adremelech and Enemelech, the gods of Seperuim. That must be why they still are so in love with their Shoah and Holocaust today. Holocaust is a burnt offering. So they, it said they acknowledged the Yira, they acknowledged Yahweh, but they also served their own gods after the ways of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. So to this day, they do what they did before. They don't really fear Yahweh. They do not follow his statutes, nor the ordinances or the law or the commandments, which he commanded the children of Jacob, who he named Israel. That right there is your actual biblical description of how the Samaritan Pentateuch would have came about. And it also should give everybody a very good idea of why this group of people claims that this God is their God, but yet all of their writings, all of their ways, all of their doings are contrary to the Bible. Because the, the Babylonian Talmud has nothing to do with the Bible other than lip service. It has a form where it will say it's pulling from laws, statutes, and judgments contained in the Bible, but it deviates at every turn. And it's extremely antithetical to the actual people that whose fathers were in covenant with this God. 
So that's this pretty is... much your origin story. What he's talking about is just tradition. This, um, you basically just described <laughs> empire. What's the name of the city so large that it incorporated many cities again? Shomrun. Uh, and, and it, the root okay. is Shomer. The root is Shomer. Shomer actually means to keep or guard. You know the guy Chuck Schumer? That yeah. his his name is from that root, Shomer. It means to huh. keep or to guard. Shomerun. Like okay. a, a keep. And it it was a, it was a huge keep too, by the way. Um there were there were battles there where the amount of, of men that died in one day at a battle at Shomer was just in, insane. It's just insane. It had to be such a, an enormous city. And and it, um, it, <clears throat> it sounds like New York. Honestly, um, there was a time when New York yeah, it was a city, but anyone inside of it, you're from one of the boroughs, which is its own yeah. land. And it... Mm -hmm. I, I can't help but look at everything geopolitically. Mm -hmm. um, our current immigration happenings over the past few years and and simple ideas about empire. Shomrun mm -hmm. sounds just like Rome, where mm -hmm. at one point keeping the empire full of people especially required such an influx of new demographics that it erased whatever culture existed from the homogenous people mm -hmm. who built it, mm -hmm. which means and the the whole story of Shumrun and and how it relates. Of course, yes, you bring them in; they pretend to follow the rules. They don't follow the rules. This is everyone's fear about mass immigration, unchecked immigration, mm -hmm. and here we find that it has a biblical parallel. Yeah. Just, not not a lot of things. That's have quite changed. interesting. No, nothing is different. There's nothing new under the sun. And do you know why? Be unlike our adversaries, do not uphold tradition, which means that we forget, and it happens again, and we are allowed to let it happen again. Yeah. Only this time, we are on the other side. Mm -hmm. It's a bit mm -hmm. tragic. So yeah. But I He's mean, saying that's that the or sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I He's was saying that the myself. origin of the Samaritan text is from this. No, he he's he's saying that the origin of the Samaritan text was. You remember how in the last section or two he he brought up his theory about um, the Mazora coming from actually. Uh, Asher, and you put that you put that M prefix on the front, and in his mind, he's using it as the from from Asher, Ma Asher, Ma Asher, -e. and everybody. By the way, um, it appears that almost every nation and people, at least to the north. Now, this is really important too because I cover this in one of the chapters in my book, and I've already written this chapter, at least about everybody to the north of the uh, territory that uh, the tribes of Israel had occupied, they tended to almost entirely speak this Aramee, which they call Aramaic. And that would include the, the Kashdim. And in fact, in the book of Daniel, starting in chapter 2, when he calls in his advisors and interpreters and because he has a dream, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and it says, and then they spoke to him in Aramee. They spoke to him in Aramee. So it, that was a relatively um, consistent, homogenous language amongst at least everyone to the north of them. Um, and so what he's saying is that um, the Hebrews, the, the Israelites, and, and it was more specifically the Judahites, because they were about the only kingdom that was left when the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, invaded the land. Um, he, he had two different sieges at Jerusalem, and he carried away a heck of a lot of people from Jerusalem, and he left a heck of a lot of people in Jerusalem, 
And a lot, a lot of people had died in those sieges too. And and Jerusalem was another one of these enormous cities, by the way. And I'm going to have a chapter on Jerusalem too, by the way. Um, yeah. Far the more lithographs. enormous than the, than the one today that they say is <laughs> Jerusalem, El, El yeah. Quds. Alia El Quds. So his his idea was that um, that they uh, kind of forgot their language and and as an ease with all of the upheaval and stuff that that had been going on. Which really the the king of Asher had carried away most of the northern and the ones across Yarden a century before, and he had set up shop at a northeast corner of the territory. In fact, and th- that had gone on for a century right there before. Um, he was defeated by Mitzram, and then that king uh, reigned at that same place at the northeast corner, which is a weird place for him to set up shop and reign at, unless you realize that the Parat ran through there. Um, and then Babel, four years after that, they and so that he, you know, would say that there's a lot of upheaval. A lot of these theories are based on models um, that are mixing. Uh, certain secular histories accepted secular histories with biblical history, and those two are not necessarily the same thing. And he would say that they sort of, uh, sort of forgot, or an easier way would be turning their vowels into consonants, everything being consonants, applying these vowel points, and then using them from from there out. The biggest problem with that, and again, he blames Esther. Um, not Esther, Ezra. Forget Esther. He mm. <laughs> he blames Ezra for this, and and there's no proof that Ezra ever did any such thing. In fact, Ezra, the scribe, and Nehemiah, who was appointed to govern the rebuilding of Jerusalem, um, they were very, very straight edged traditionalists, very much so. In fact, Nehemiah was so much so that he had been called back to Paris, which is always translated as Persia. Paris. He had been called back uh, for some time. And, and when he comes back from there, he, uh, he was horrified because so many of not only the Judahites, but the Luim or Levites had married uh, other peoples, specifically like the um, the the Pelshet, uh, the Philistines, and and others, and th- their children, he said, their children didn't even know our language. Now, this wasn't a vast majority, so we can't say, well, there, that's what happened. No, it was a certain amount, and he went about as soon as he got back remedying that. So Mm -hmm. this idea that they changed in these ways, it's it's just not consistent with the text. It's, again, one of those things where they're taking traditions, and these are rabbinic traditions, and they are wrongfully applying them to the, the narrative. That just never happened in the Bible. It's, again, it's tradition, it's rabbinic, and it comes from the same people who gave us Masoretic Hebrew. And, and that, you know, for me, it's kind of like long story short in this because he's been over this ground before. We, we went over this earlier. It's just that he decided that he needed a whole section to regurgitate that. Now, funny enough, um, in this section, he, he says that um, what he means to do is not necessarily, again, get us to where perhaps we can speak Hebrew, the original Hebrew, um, but at least understand it. And that that's kind of like how he wraps the section there um, by just regurgitating the same old nonsense and then telling us that um, he's going to light the way for us, which is so nice of him. Was there anything about this section that that you wanted to comment on before we, we do the next one? The next one's going to be, wow, a real bear. Honestly, nothing that we haven't gone over. Yeah. Um, he, 
he says things that are familiar, but because I remember he talks about them earlier. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, digging too deeply into this, I mean, the only thing we could glean from this is whether or not his claims here and uh, his aforementioned claims are consistent or not. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, I'm, I'm ready to hear what Maury has to say rather than mm. pick over his ideas of where something came from. Yeah. I do like I do like that he talks about um where is it? 86. Whereas the greater part yielding to the proneness of their gross ideas lost as had the Samaritans the real meaning of the sacred text, the text remained mm. entirely concealed in its characters the knowledge of which was preserved by an oral tradition. So here he hearkens back to what he wants us to believe is the origin of the Kabbalah. Yeah, you're right, which you can't prove. Yeah. And, um, of course, the, the no, mainstream... No, I'm just inclined to trust <clears throat> what he says about it. Yeah. Man, I'm, I mean, the mainstream story is... Um, it kind of is what he's saying, too, because the mainstream story does harken all the way back to that time period. They they try to say that they try to blame it on Ezra, too. All they all they do is they say that they standardized it in the seventh to 10th century. But that but they do tend to blame it on Ezra. No proof of that whatsoever. It just makes me think that he didn't do it and might have even tried to stop it. <laughs> That's all yeah. I can think. Well, and, 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 you know, and, and we, we also know that the, the people that had moved into the land, uh, at the time that the King of, uh, of, of Asher had displaced him, um, they had moved in a century before Judah had gone to Babel. Uh, Judah had been in Babel for a good 70 years plus, depending on how you calculate the two different sieges. Um, and so by the time they came back, uh, th that had happened. What I, why I'd read from second Kings 17, that had happened a long, long, long time before. So when they get back and this is recorded, uh, at least to, to one degree or another in both Ezra and Nehemiah, and they're going about building the temple. Um, these people consisting of, uh, th those various same people, they mentioned people from Babel, people from Hamat, um, this, uh, Oreb people or Orebim people, um, they're, they're kind of all a conglomeration now in a sense, you know, they've like with most of the other tribes and civilizations in, in this area, they, they, they all kind of mixed with, with one another. They come to them and they say, um, we want to build this with you. We want to build this with you because your God is our God, um, because they had had this, um, whatever this, uh, this Kanim had given them. And perhaps it was the Samaritan Pentateuch. Maybe they had, had have preserved it relatively well over the years. And so when they do, um, the, the Judahites that had come back, it was mostly Judahites, Levites, and Benjamites. And they tell them, no, they say it's, you can't, you can't build this with us. They don't, they don't say, um, it's because you're lesser people. It doesn't say because we're a superior race. It doesn't say anything like that. It says, because it has been tasked to us to do this thing. And you're not allowed to do this with us. So like with a number of other, um, people in say the last century, these were not white supremacists, okay? These were people that knew that their people were given a certain task amongst all peoples of the world, and they were guarding that task and their place amongst the, the grand scheme of all peoples and things. This is all that was going on. But of course, this enraged the people that came to them that wanted to be a part of that. Um, and that's really all that happened. They just told them, it's just not your job. We can't let you do that. It's, it's our job and it's yeah. our thing to do. And you see this trope in movies and stories all the time. Someone says, let me help. And the other person says, no, this is something I have to do for myself. Yeah. Now, if and you put that on a governmental stage and a political level, 
<laughs> this is something our people have to do. No, no, no. Yeah. We're going to help you. Yeah. And that's the thing. This is a people. And we're talking about a people that for a very long time had been tracked through the ages, not because they were special or better. And the text says that it's not because they were special or better, um, but because. And, you know, when somebody is is choosing somebody for something. Um, they can have any reason they want, especially if they're in charge of everything. And that's what we're seeing in the story, that a people have been tasked to preserve something for one thing. Um, that's the job of that people. Now, there are people out there that turn it into a lot of things that it's not. But one thing that it is is that there have been agreements made between the creator, the, the God or deity, the allium of this story and this particular people. But what happens is over the years, this is another thing we can see. We can see this very clearly in our own day and age that this people, this conglomeration of a number of people who eventually they, they mixed together and became uh, sort of another people, um, they have down throughout the years not only claimed to be that people that were originally inhabited there, but they claimed that uh, that God was their God and that they had a certain inside uh, access to him and, you know, of course, that their holy men were the holy men and so on and so forth, while at the same time harboring a deeply ingrained hatred for this people because specifically of this, this particular situation that's described in both Ezra and Nehemiah is one of a number of reasons why this particular people who is still on the face of the earth today hates this other people. And so there's your, there's your history of it as according to the Bible, not as according to Dialabe <laughs> or the rabbis. So the next section is actually just a, a couple of pages, but it's big. And I think that, Look, I, I can actually just real quick, we've only been recording for 30 minutes. You know, it doesn't even matter if we had to, to, to chop it because we can pick it right back up um, uh -huh. within within two pages. Um, he has two pages of text and then he gets into these the basics of the symbols and a little bit is coming from him and and a lot seems to be coming from Court de Geblin. Mm hmm. I did highlight a few things when I was going through this just because <laughs> um, they're saying exactly the same thing that I had been saying for a year or two. And so in a way, it, it's it's confirming. Um, he, he says now the first person and he qu he quotes uh, quotes um, de Gebelin a lot here because he's going a lot off of his work. And of course I haven't read the work that he's going off of. And I doubt I would agree with everything from Gebelin either. But if these guys are deceivers, they may be both of them may be, I don't know yet. Um, what the, you have to give anybody a pretty good amount of substantial, solid, meaty truth if you're going to mislead them, which could be the reason that, um, that some of these quotes are, are so right to the heart of it um, that really strip down um, the, the problems. And keep in mind, again, that um, by the time that uh, D'Alave wrote this, you did have guys like, uh, like John Thompson and Adam Clark and others who saw right through Masoretic and the Mazora. The problem is they, they didn't really, or, or their publishings, they haven't made it to today. And 
Now, there may have been people that published about this. I just haven't found them. And I've looked for about every kind of old book I could even find that was challenging the the narrative of the Mazora. But um, by then, they already had a lot of people challenging it. So is this controlled opposition? I don't know. But he quotes from de Gebelin, like right on the first page, saying, how could one fail to recognize here the finger of the all-powerful? Now, this is de Gebelin, he says, de Gebelin is saying that this language came down from the hand of God himself. And here's where I believe that uh, de Alave is showing that he's a hypocrite or he's, he's dual-minded or something. Because, of course, he always wants to say that there was somehow the Hebrew started out one way and that it was influenced by the Egyptian hieroglyphic and became something else. And he doesn't seem to be getting his story straight. De Gebelin continues, how could one imagine that words had no energy by themselves, uh, that they had no value, which was not conventional and which might not always be different, that the name of Lamb might be that of wolf and the name of vice, that of virtue, etc. This is exactly what I've been saying for a very long time. And he says the same thing. Um, I hate the way that he expresses it because he uses so many negatives in that key expression that you have to, you have to do that whole negative math and bring it back into the positive. When he says, (laughs) I hate when people do that, that they had no value, which was not conventional and which might not always be different. And what he's saying is um, that they had value that was only conventional. Um, How could anybody believe that words were not initially imbued with inherent value and initial power yes. that they couldn't just be changed based on convention. We're not talking about colloquialisms. We're not talking about figures of speech. We're not talking about languages that are so empty like English that it can be changed so drastically that you can make of it ebonics, that you can make of it um Anything from the King James and Shakespearean English to uh, to that of the garbage that we speak today in comparison with that. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. How can anyone actually believe that about a language? If you did, then you have to believe that it came from man. And there's really no meaning, period. How can you get meaning? How can you derive meaning? If it came from man, it's corrupt. And it was corrupt from the beginning. And as I've said in the past, when I first started waking up to this, you're going to be dependent on some man's lexicon and you might as well just give up. If it wasn't handed down from the designer of all of this, that's all you're left with is some man's invention and interpretation and you better find the right lexicon because they can twist and turn anything any way they wish yes and the quote the quote backs you into a corner if you in my paraphrase of that very quote can't you see that there is more meaning than the vulgar and that things may have been rearranged. They could have meant the opposite or been different. Now, this this means that if you don't agree with de Gebelin here, that you must embrace uh, a, a type of circular nihilism about language as a whole, and then it would be arbitrary and pure historical factoid with no deeper meaning. And honestly, whether he's about to trash Court de Geblin for this or back him up, that very quote supports your argument, which only goes to show that, yes, 
this entire book is an argument for, for De Olive, but herein lies an example dependent on the context with which it's presented. Mm. And it means that I have to read mm. what what this quote came from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing It's that... like when people pull a Bible quote outside of context. Mm-hmm. Just it's for its difficult. own sake. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're using it to make your argument, but what does it really yeah. say? I'd yeah. like to dig deeper into that and, mm-hmm. and find this passage in the book proper. Well, with as much as he's used uh, De Gebelin so far, um, and it doesn't look like he's going to necessarily depart from the use of De Gebelin, or at least the quoting of him, sure wouldn't hurt. Um, now, he goes on to quote what he believes to be kind of the contrast to De Gebelin, which is a man named Hobbes. And what Hobbes says is we cannot from experience conclude that anything is to be called just or unjust, true or false, or any proposition universal whatsoever, except it be from remembrance of the use of names imposed arbitrarily by men. Now that is the voice of the age. That would be the reasoning of our age. That was the mindset that I could not reconcile with because it is a nihilistic, circular reasoning. Well, it's a circular reasoning that ought to lead somebody to nihilism in the least. Yes, or or to that facsimile of self-empowerment, which is autotheism. We mm-hmm. made it from nothing. We're here for no reason. We are the greatest power that exists. And that's just as dangerous, if not more, because nihilism has its poison, which is purpose. And autotheism, I would call autotheism or uh, um, existentialism, um, I would call that pride itself which is dangerous no matter what amount Mm -hmm. you see and this is funny this is really funny too because Dialave now illustrates within two pages here of this chapter three of how he is either double minded or um, a shill I don't know because he says he says at the uh, at the uh, bottom of page 90, I shall show he's not quoting. I shall show that the works which compose the tongues in general and those of the Hebraic tongue in particular, far from being thrown at hazard and formed by the explosion of an arbitrary caprice, as has been asserted, are on. Now he's talking about as Hobbes asserted are on the contrary produced by a profound reason. I shall prove that there is not a single one that may not by means of a well-made grammatical analysis be brought back to the fixed elements of a nature immutable as to substance, although variable to infinity as to forms. Most of that I'm good with enough to let him keep leading and just critique as we go but what happened what happened to hebrew um being influenced so drastically in egypt i don't know um does he then believe that these hebrews in egypt that were making mud bricks um as structural members uh, also formed some kind of perfect language that he wants to restore because, you know, well, I don't know about you, but the language that he described at first in this book um, as being uh, some kind of, I don't even think he thought it was perfect before Egypt, the language that he seemed to describe before what he says Ezra did to it was already a bastard as far as I'm concerned. Does he want to give us the bastard? 
or does he want to give us the bastard's bastard? Uh, so he's, he said that the Sanskrit was the most beautiful sounding. He said that the Chinese was the most visually stunning, both yeah. incredible, and that Hebrew, which is actually Egyptian, is the perfect amalgam of the two and that he was going to try to restore the Hebrew before it was broken with their exodus from Egypt before they lost that perfect language that they had constructed. So what he says here with this statement on page 90 uh, that you just quoted, mm. he's saying that, let me put it into analogy, that the golden ratio that we find in nature is intelligent design. You've heard that argument. Is it accident or intelligence? Yeah. Well, he's saying that that it, it didn't naturally evolve, that it was created. This is an autotheistic statement. Mm -hmm. Egypt made the perfect tongue on purpose, and I'm going to bring it back. Yeah, and the thing is, he still has an and maybe you were you were just saying this he he still has an a priori um understanding of hebrew that it was it was still some sort of amalgamation from sanskrit and chinese ah no no not that it came from sanskrit and, or chinese but that each of them is notable for a, a specific trait the sound and the sight so he and wasn't suggesting saying it was that, an amalgam? No, no, an amalgam of those virtues. He oh, was the saying virtues. that the Hebrew okay. is both uh, both orally and visually Because I started thinking I had forgotten something earlier in the text. No, okay, no. Okay, now just, I know he's... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, yeah, that's a hell of a thing because I, I still incredibly disagree with his premise. This isn't the Egyptian tongue. Might have been widespread in Mithram, mm. but he's wrong about Egypt. He's wrong about, about the, um, the Hebrew being made perfect and broken in a different part of the world. This is going to shade everything that he says, but mm. that still doesn't mean that the tricks he learned to take the language apart and understand it won't be useful. Or might be a missing puzzle piece that helps precisely. me understand it. <clears throat> yeah, precisely. Yeah, I mean his um, his his beliefs of of etymology and origin and philology and morphology, um, you know, they may or may not be organic, and uh, whatever they are, they they still may not hinder us getting further down the road because. I know for a fact just by going through the next page that I have extremely different beliefs than him just based on this. Um, <clears throat> he does make the claim um, that he is, uh, he says, I have given the name of sign. So he's applying that again. We, I said this last time, but it's what I call glyph or character. A lot of people call it a lot of different things. It's an ideogram or ideograph. They comprise, as I have said, the voice, the gesture, and the traced characters. It is to the traced characters that we shall apply ourselves. Since the voice is extinct, he says, and the gesture disappeared, they alone will furnish us a subject amply vast for reflections. Now, yeah, I mean, nobody can actually say uh, or has with accuracy where they can really back it up with the voices. So I guess we'll have to go with the um, uh, traced character. And, you know, he, again, he, he keeps the, uh, the form of, he keeps the form of Masoretic, and I, I'd have a hard time believing that they did not have um, 
artifact and textual evidence. I mean, yeah, I know they didn't have, for instance, the the Dead Sea Scrolls, which again, the Dead Sea Scrolls isn't even what I would consider Paleo Hebrew. It's it's more of a little bit more of a script of what we see with like block calligraphic Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and, I really and have an doubts. Admitted forgery. Yeah. <laughs> I have some serious doubts about that. Anybody who wa- who hasn't heard of, of this, um, there's a guy. I will try to find the link because I'm pretty sure I still have a channel that has a video by him. And I'm sorry I'm having trouble remembering his name. He's probably a shell. And he, he had a partner who is probably a shell. <laughs> but the thing is, the great things about shells is once you figure out what their game is, you know what they're playing on and what they're playing off. And he does a little presentation on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the things he's saying aren't necessarily new, but oftentimes they're not as widely published. Shills tend to try to beat that sort of thing to the punch. Okay. And so they tend to give away things um, before you hear it from another source in the correct context. But the point that he makes is very good concerning the type of material that the Dead Sea Scrolls was written on and its problem with availability and when it was mostly used. It's pretty interesting, actually. Um, so what he does is he he saying that he's he's going to use a court de Gebelin model of these glyphs or. I want to I'm I'm probably always going to say sign too because he does break this down into his four categories. Um I'm just not willing to change my definition from glyph to sign, but that's a little bit arbitrary. Um so he he essentially gives the uh and it's like he says 16 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 he does stick with the 16 okay and these are basically what he says uh to Gebelin reduced these uh the signs to or glyphs to and what that forces him to do is pair them and in my opinion this is the first really big um subversive move now he doesn't really uh, contradict him there's not and, and actually we, we can read the little paragraph below too uh, at the end of this but um I, it wouldn't hurt just to go through and we can say what what he says now um since he's using their characters their signs the masoretic i'll i'll just go by by their names as i go through this <clears throat> and i'll probably give the the obri name too so he starts with the aleph or a ah, and it's equivalent to our modern a and he says that this is now remember we're talking about principles here the, the, he's just going through what i i think i have said in the past is um is sort of the elemental part of this. And I almost want to read the the last paragraph before I do this, but uh, I'll do this. Mm, So he, he's going to boil it down. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. This is, this is basically, and that's why it's 22 characters in 16 categories because he's he's boiling it down. And I, I think that especially when you get to the double character categories, it does a terrible disservice to these things. They have some similarities sometimes, but not always. So the Aleph or Ah, he, he says, like our modern A, man himself as collective unity, principle, master and ruler of the earth. Now, should I actually, along with this, perhaps give what my best interpretation is of Obri as I've seen them in the words, maybe that would be helpful. Um, in a sense, I see that as relatively correct in some ways. Um, the ah oftentimes seems to augment 
And because I believe that there is, with these glyphs, signs, or characters, a first position and an end position, or, or just first and second position, uh, how it would relate to a thing if it was before it, and how it would relate to a thing if it was after it. Um, in the case of A, ah, it's quite possible that it, it, its, posi its position relationship is perhaps when it is before another character, um, meaning above in the sense that when somebody is speaking in first person in Obri, they use the a ah before the action. Um, well, let me see if I can expand on that. The word for mouth typically is pe. It is the, the actual glyph pe with the, followed by the glyph e, pe. The word for nose or nostrils, and it's also used in the abstract for anger, is ap. So it's the a uh, followed by the pe. I, I had strained over this forever, wondering why on earth it would be that, because so many words having to do with things on the face or the face itself. The face um, is the word pani or panim. Why so many of them proceed from the mouth or, or have to do with the pe, has the pe in there. Um, and at least in the case of nostrils, nose, and the abstract anger, I believe it's called that because it is above the mouth. Um, up. Um, and it's true that actually mouth can serve as, or the pe, as uh, an opening, any kind of opening or lip uh, to anything. It's very true. Now what the A would have to do with it, because first off, it's not in the plural. Like apim, it's just up, meaning the nose or the nostrils or anger, you know. Um, and because of other word forms I've seen and the fact that they could work if A in first position was in a sense putting itself above the second position glyph and in last position either below or some type of diminutive, not like it was in first position, that that could actually work. The jury is still out on it. So I do believe that in a sense, he's right in some of the things that he says, but not in all of the things. He is right in saying it's something to do with manner himself because you think of it like alpha in the designations assigned peoples, uh, according to the old mythos of those women rulers who would assign those designations to men, alpha, beta, you know, and so forth, gamma, mm -hmm. so forth. Um, being the uh, the most chief or principal, the alpha. And the fact that it's at the the head of the glyph set, I don't find that to be uh, arbitrary either. No. And the the first three that he states, master, ruler, organ of speech, and uh, the hand of man half close taking action. Mm-hmm. So it's you have that uh, classification there. Yeah. So I, in that sense, I'm I'm really good with this idea of uh, the principle of of ah. Um. Now the next thing is where we do have a problem, him and I, and a little bit, a little bit, because the problem is you can blend these things because they're. There is a certain amount, I believe, of um, consistency in, in the way something is, is used or, or could be um, seen. Now, he, he blends the pe and bet. That's what they're called in, in Hebrew. Um, actually, I call pe about the same thing or be like our modern p or b. And that's when he says that... This is very much like the mouth of a man as an organ of speech, his interior, his habitation, every central object. Now, um, this is interesting. He, he really could have broke that into two and should have. 
Yeah, the the be again, this is another one just like pe, which I believe has a different usage at the front of a word than at the end of a word. You take ba, which meaning come or brought, it has to do with bringing, not going. If you're going, you you would have tsa. You take ba and ab. Ab being the common word for father, ba being bring, come. Um, the ba plays a different role between those two. So does the a, ah, and that would be a great study for me to actually complete is figuring out those two words. Obviously, the ba, because of the amount of words that it's in, almost always has to do with bringing whatever is after it inward when it's a be, um, like beat for home. Um, let's see, you have... I'll just go right up to my uh, my Obery Strong's word list so I can just look at these letters as I go. Um, like bar would be a well or burr would be a well. Um, and then it just goes so on and so forth. Now you have uh, ones like bed, which is uh, sort of apart from um, or bean in between it's the word used for in between and so on and so forth so in that same sort of way i guess with pe um let me just go to the list on p real quick here the pez so words like because i can't remember all uh 6000 plus words at once um Obviously, ones like pe being mouth, um, p or y p mm -hmm. would be like pretty in in the sense of like smile. And there's actually a lot of words that start with a pe that have a lot to do with the face or beauty. A lot of words that end with the pe, however, have a lot to do with the form. A, um, a for instance, rep or repa. Uh, having to do with your form. It can either mean healthy or it's the word used for a giant. Um, rapae, um, the word for a physician. Um, let's see. Well, pani, I just said, or panim, the face. Let me find some other ones that right off the rip I know are definitely uh, the correct word. Um Peleg having to do with division, um, the P of working as, again, an edge or mouth. Um, get to some better ones here. Uh, a lot of these are words that I, I really couldn't vouch for. Pass. Pass is a good one. That's um, like something frilly. And it would be the idea of, of oh. frills coming from the mouth of a garment. So the coat that uh, Jacob gives to Joseph, it's always translated as the coat of many colors. That's bullcrap. The coat is called a <laughs> pas. Yeah. It's a pas. He gave him a coat that was pas. It was frilly. It is something that you would give to your son or whomever was not going to do manual labor. He so gave he, him a pretty jacket. He gave him something with frills. You've <laughs> seen those old, you know, those old garments that have frills on the cuffs and on the collar. Oh, yeah. That, that's the way that, that it, in certain cultures for a very long time, a gentleman or somebody who was of high stature would wear something like that because it was very decorative. That's precisely what I'm saying is that's precisely what that word describes. It begins with mouth, the edge. And it ends with S, curly or curved. And it's used as a descriptive of the coat he gave him. It was frilly. In the mouths, where's the mouth? A cuff is a mouth. The neck of a shirt is a mouth. Anything that's an opening is a mouth. The cavity is a mm -hmm. mouth. Yeah. So you have that word right in there. Um, let's see. If I can go through some more here. Um, 
And there's a ton of words with uh, the uh, the root being par. Peroa is one of them, who I have a feeling was always a child king, or at least an adolescent. Why? Par. Par is probably most commonly used for an adolescent animal. Um, the mouth. The mouth's often at the edge. The edge of with the air or are at the end, which oftentimes has a great deal to do with stature, eminence, or importance. Either in height as in full grown, like um, I just sh- illustrated with Rapa. Um, How about... Or importance. Um, ma. Uh, the word M-A-W meaning a uh, vast opening. And that's an obery? No, no, that's that's English, but it's been widely used actually for a few hundred years. Ma, Ma. yeah, uh, hmm. a vast uh, opening. Often, it often denotes uh, a large creature. The mouth, throat, crop. Interesting. Or gullet. Also, uh, of, uh, I'm just looking it up mouth. in my yeah. dictionary. Mm-hmm. I'm not very smart. I hope everybody's caught on to that. <laughs> Nobody believes oh. you when you say that. Let's see. The <laughs> mouth, throat, or stomach uh, of a, a carnivore. Right. The maw. The maw. Yeah. But you say a word like that, and I think, oh, well, shoot, that could be Aubrey. Um, so that's simplistic. That's all, all, also used as a... That's interesting. Well, the thing is about M, and he's, he has to cover M. He's going to. Um Boy, is the jury out on M. Obviously, it has connotations of water. A lot of our modern words, of course, we inherited from Obery, and some of them are really clear. Um, some of them not so much. Some of them have been phonetically changed a lot. Um, I'm going to see if there's actually, I'm, I'm looking through my M's, if there's an Obery equ- a, equivalent or something close to it. Um, well, okay. Well, we have ma a, which that should be 3967. Um, I think I remember that actually. I don't know if that has, well, here's the funny thing. I don't know if where you were going with that, but I can tell you, um, interestingly enough, the throat, (laughs) um, the throat has nothing to do with the letter that's right. Ma e is a hundred. The number a uh-huh. hundred is ma e. Go through a few of them real quick, though. Um, now, ma ui. Interesting desire. Now, a great number and desire. Okay, so the thing is, by the time you get to ma'um, mm-hmm. that's translated as like blemish. And that really throws everything off. The um is a really interesting suffix that I haven't even had time to, to get familiar with. You have uh, ma'ume, and it's translated as, as anything, nothing, ought, or any, which I wonder if it goes back to a relationship with desire. See, desire is a really interesting thing. It manifests in other words, too. And it seems to have a lot to do with things that are rapacious, appetite. Now, when mm-hmm. I look at, yeah, when I look at Ma in um, the free dictionary by Farlex, um, it seems to have everything to do with the mouth or throat. Yes, and and also you said rapacious appetite. Yeah. Um, now, whenever ma is used in terms of a, a creature, then it is a it's a creature with a, a blind gnawing hunger, and so mm. it's it it is pure um, pure hunger instinct. Like yeah. there's no intelligence or emotion tied to the description. It is mm-hmm. simply uh, that which consumes. Desire. Yes. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. That's just uh, the word. That's okay. The word went through my head as you were going through this, and I had to well, shout it out. <clears throat> yeah. Well, this this should be very free form. I don't really want this to be rigid at all. Going through these, mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> because you know, f- first off, I want to be able to rip out as as many words as I can think that would, for one thing, either illustrate my cause or if they made a better one, illustrate theirs. Um, and I certainly want to hear any, um, ideas or, uh, uh, impressions that you get along the way, cause that's going to get us way further than anything rigid on this. Um, if people wanted rigidity, they could just pick up the book, they could read it and fall asleep on their own. Um, so that's good. But the thing is, I know that we've been at it a couple of hours and, uh, I've just got things I've got to get done um but this would be really good because then we can actually pick right up in the midst of this um just Mm -hmm. review the first couple of real quick and and then rip right into uh the rest of these and actually he only has after this another page or two on origin of signs and their development And then he goes right into uh, a whole nother aspect of these characters again. And it's going to give us a heck of a lot to to throw out there and to chew on before we even get into um, all of his material on on the noun, which is really good, which is is really good because it would be great if we didn't get to that point where he starts talking so much uh, about the noun without a great idea of what we at least <laughs> kind of believe. And when I say we, I mean, I know I've already got my ideas, but just everyone that would be following along with this would have a really good idea of what they believe these glyphs or signs or characters to be before moving forward because i i think that there is a certain amount of uh, logical form to these and i think there's there's a certain amount of logical conclusions that can be drawn um if we understand the basic form and function of these signs or glyphs yeah okay well then let's let's just cut it there We'll pick right up right there at the list next time and and be good and fresh. And uh, good. yeah, and I think we'll get a lot accomplished there. So, all right. We will see then everybody next time. Episode six, where we pick right up with Gebelin's 16 boiled down versions of Paleo Hebrew and, uh, Let's uh, contrast that with Obery. So, all right, Nathan, thanks again. Mm-hmm.